Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second public meeting to discuss the Upper Namaskit River Enhancement Plan. Um, my name is Emily Vogler. Um, I know many of you, and I'll be helping to facilitate the meeting this evening. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen um, so that we can follow along in the presentation, um, but I just want to start off by thanking you all for being here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen clearly now. Yep, excellent. Great, so um, just to start off, I wanna thank Lake Cam for hosting us again this evening. Um, they've been amazing and helping as we're still operating in re this remote fashion. Um, and just to um, put a plug in for these amazing videos that Lake Cam has produced um, about the Namaskit River. It's really, I think, an excellent overview that tells um, an amazing story about the river and about the people, many of you, um, who are deeply connected um, and stewards of this river. So thank you for hosting. Um, also, just thanks to Alan and Monica for for helping to organize the paddle in the Masket River. We went on a um, paddle in June and it was just a fantastic um, day on the river and really excellent for getting um, more familiar with some of the um, kind of issues on the river and just getting to see it firsthand. Um, so Monica mentioned that she's been going out even kind of very recently. And so hopefully everybody gets a chance to explore the river um, firsthand to get you know, more familiar with, um, with the river. And so just a kind of um, overview of where we are here tonight. Um, we are in the second of uh, what are going to be three public meetings to be discussing the Upper Namaskit River um, Enhancement Plan. The first public meeting, which was in March, um, was intended to discuss the vision for the river and to help to develop and refine the project objectives. Um, tonight, the goal is to discuss the project objectives um, and the alternative packages. And then the third public meeting, which is really the most important one, and I hope all of you will plan to attend, is when we will have a chance to evaluate how well the different alternative packages meet the project objectives. Um, and so the, the structure of this has been set up in a way to try to get input along the way, but really this third public meeting that'll be coming up in the fall will be extremely important to get your input on the various alternatives. So the plan for tonight is we're going to start off with an introductory presentation um, for myself and some of the other project team members. Um, in the presentation, we will debrief from the first public meeting um, for those of you who are unable to attend um, and talk about the project objectives that we've developed from that meeting um, and where we're at today um, with the project objectives. Um, Neil on our team will be doing an overview of the hydrology and hydraulics model and then discussing some of the alternative packages. Um, after that, we will have small group discussions about the project objectives and the alternative packages just to get feedback from all of you to make sure we're, we're on the right page with everything, see if you have any input or thoughts about anything that we're missing or any other ideas that we should be considering um, during this phase. Um, coming out of that meeting, we can report out just to have another discussion, and then we'll be wrapping up and discussing the next steps um, specific to the third um, public meeting coming up. And so just a kind of reminder, um, when working with Zoom, please mute yourself and turn, you can turn off your video, or keep it on during the presentation. I like to see other faces, so feel free to turn it on. Um, you Please, you know, take notes while we are presenting in this introductory presentation. Um, you could feel free to just, you know, take notes on your own paper, or if you also feel free to type them into the chat um, box within Zoom. Um, and then after the um, this introductory presentations will be divided up into um, maybe two groups um, in order to um, discuss the project objectives and the alternatives in more detail. And there's really kind of no need for anything except to click join when we ask you to. And um, try not once you're in the different breakout groups to leave unless you're actually planning to leave the workshop, um, just because otherwise it gets difficult to reorganize people, but not a big deal if it happens. Um, and then once we're in the breakout rooms, we will, everybody will unmute and turn on their videos in order to have um, a discussion. Um, we are going to be recording this workshop just so that we can take notes and make sure that we capture everything that everybody says. Um, and if at any point you do accidentally, um, you know, leave, um, just you can use the same link in order to re-enter into the workshop. Um, and then lastly, as always, when we're working on Zoom, it is possible that we get Zoom bombed, meaning that somebody might come in and say or do inappropriate things. If that happens, you know, fingers crossed. Not, it won't. Um, you could just, you know, turn off the sound on your computer and walk away, or you could leave the meeting and then rejoin after a couple of minutes um, using the same link. So just some precautionary measures, um, but hope, like, hopefully that will not be an issue. And just a kind of review of some of the different kind of features on the bottom, just to mute, stop your video um, and chat right down here. 
if you have anything you want to add. Um, and then as always, um, and in this group, it's often not an issue, but just, um, you know, one of the goals of these meetings is just to be respectful of each other, um, respect the viewpoints of others. Um, during our small group discussions, making sure we let everybody have time to speak um, and not to interrupt. And then also just to understand that we as a project team are not here to um, advocate for any specific alternative or solution. We're really here to explore how a range of alternatives can meet the goals for the future of the Namaskat River. And that's really the goal of this process is just to have an open discussion about those alter possible alternatives. Um, we have an amazing project team, many of them who are here on the call today. Um, from SIRPED, we have Bill and Helen, which many of you are familiar with. We have Danica from Mass Audubon and Maria and Sarah from Nature Conservancy. Um, Neil is, um, and I don't think Ellie's on the call, but Neil's here from Horsley Witten Group and the project engineer. Um, I myself it, have a firm that helps to facilitate processes around rivers and discussions around rivers. Um, and then Eric Wahlberg, um, who um, has his own climate service um, um, firm. So, so it's an amazing project team and i um, excited to be working with everybody and also to be working with our amazing steering committee. Um, many of you are here on the call and thank you for joining. Um, and they've really been instrumental along the, the way to help guide this process and to be able to provide um, input um, in between these public meetings um, and to ensure that we are kind of staying on track and also just providing um, detailed kind of input along the way. So, um, so thank you to the steering committee um, for all your help and support. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Helen um, so that she could talk a little bit about the relationship between um, the work that we're doing here with the Upper Namaskat River Enhancement Plan and how it corresponds with a parallel process that has happening at the same time um, for the Aswamsa Pond and Namaskat River Watershed Management um, Action Plan, just so that we can kind of keep clear that, that there are these two parallel processes that are taking place simultaneously. Helen, do you want to jump in? Yeah, Emily, thank you so much. So um, I'll just... Um... On this slide, I really do love this graphic here because I think it captures it pretty well in that the if, the, if you think of the Aswamsa Pond and Amaskit River Watershed Management and Climate Action Plan process, it really is kind of um, the big tent, it's the large bucket into which a bunch of different projects are feeding um, their ultimate recommendations and public engagement work into that plan. Um, so the Namaskit River Enhancement Plan, it's uh, focused on a smaller geographic area. It is purely from the outlet. Oh, this is great, thank you. Um, so you can see it here, it's from the uh, outlet of the pond up through to, to, run out to Wayham Street really, a little bit past in the H&H model, but um, it's a small component of a much larger watershed where you can see that outlined on the, the left-hand side with the kind of uh, dark black line, that's the whole APC and Masket River watershed. And so this is a smaller component of that. Um, and it allows us to get really specific about a portion of the watershed that has already had a lot of pre-existing work and that we can kind of, you know, eventually a lot of different parts of the watershed, we hope will get a similar treatment. But um, since we already have a lot of background, a lot of studies and kind of a lot of history of goals and objectives, we are starting here on um, a much more kind of detailed scale study. Yeah, so um, this is a good thing to keep in mind. So inside of this, this particular upper Namaskat work that we're focused on here tonight, we're thinking about issues related to the Aswamsat Pond Dam as the kind of one bookend of the study area. We're thinking about the upper Namaskat River Channel and its relationship to adjacent wetlands and other land uses. We're talking about the various river crossings that the Namaskat passes through when it transitions as it as it moves from the APC Dam up to Wareham Street. And then that last endpoint there, the Wareham Street Dam, also known as the Basco Dam, are really the kind of key points that we're, we're hitting on in this study. And the larger management plan um, will take the recommendations from this project and so make sure they're kind of enshrined in one place. But it also considers other, other larger watershed scale um, concerns and objectives. So things like water supply and water management permits, um, stormwater management as it runs off various landscapes and makes its way from upland areas uh, downstream into the into the pond system and into the river. And then um, whereas we're kind of looking at the, the, the physical um, element of the dams, the, the larger plan gets to kind of the operations and management of those systems. Um, and the I'll just add that the watershed management plan, it's also a climate action plan. So it does have this thread of climate, 
climate change and resilience running through it as well. And the, um, yeah, this is just a nice kind of very, very nice graphical representation of, again, that, that two bookend area that goes from the ponds to Harem Street, and then the various bridge crossings that happen along the way. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Helen. Excellent. Here's just some photos. I know that all of you are very familiar with the river, but just some photos to help um, us remember what it is that we're specifically talking about um, in the meeting today. Um, excellent. So I want to um, just do a quick debrief um, from the first public meeting um, that took place in March. I know that many of you were there and thank you. Um, but for those of you who were not there, I just wanted to do a quick recap just to get you up to speed on where we are today and what it is that we're building on in this meeting. Um, so our first public meeting, um, like I said, was in March. Um, and the goals there was to really just kind of do a basic introduction of the project. Um, to clarify the relations between this project and other projects, just like Helen did just now. Um, Neil did a great introduction to some basics of river hydrology that will help us as we work together this coming year. And really the most important part of the first public meeting was to get a better understanding from the participants about the issues that are important to them and to ensure that the, um, they were actually reflected, right, as we were developing our project objectives. And so you'll see this little diagram, this silly diagram that I made, which is essentially saying, you know, here we are today in 2021. And as we go through this planning process, where do we want to get to? What are our goals? What it is that we're specifically trying to address through this planning process? Um, and so that was really the goal of our first public meeting. Um, and we had a series of breakout group discussions with a couple of specific questions that we asked to the participants. Um, and we used a program called Jamboard in order to just take notes. Um, and we, the, a couple of questions we asked were, when you imagine a healthy, resilient Namaska River, what does it look like to you? Um, we heard information, obviously, about some of the key issues that often come up in terms of water flow, the invasive species, um, issues around um, recreation um, in the in the river, obviously a lot of issues around fish passage and a lot of other information that we were able to collect um, from that discussion. Um, we asked about some of the issues that we want to make sure to um, that were addressed, which we had a lot of similar kind of responses to that first question, but we kind of pulled them all together, um, thinking about what we wanted to make sure we protected through the process in terms of the species, um, land protection, recreation. Um, we had another question about um, the five most important project objectives and goals, um, and we had some great responses that just helped us to think through and prioritize some of the different objectives that were being developed. Um, and then I thought this was a really um, fantastic. We had got some great responses in terms of thinking about how the community could be good stewards of the river. Um, some of this falls obviously outside of this planning process, but I think can really inform things moving forward, especially when it comes to the watershed management plan and thinking about how to um, how to really think about how to connect people to the river and how to care for the river. And so there was some really excellent feedback that we received. Um, we took all of the feedback from the first public meeting, um, and in addition to the discussion during the public meeting, we also had many discussions with the steering committee in order to pr pr to develop this initial set of project objectives. Um, and really the project objectives are essentially this, it's about here we are today, what is it we're trying to achieve in this process? Um, and, we, um, and we listed them out here, this is an initial draft um, and I'll read through them, but one of the goals um, for today's meeting is that during our small group discussions, we wanna hear from you all to make sure that these project objectives are capturing what we think is really important for us to be addressing through this planning process. And so you all will have a chance during the breakout groups to provide feedback on these. So, um, so feel free to take notes, feel free to, um, you know, kind of think about that as we are, as I'm reading through these. Um, so some of the key project objectives that have emerged from our discussions, um, obviously there are ecological objectives to this planning process, um, including improving passage of adult and juvenile herring and other anadromous fish, enhancing water quality for drinking water and ecosystem health, improving low flow aquatic connectivity, restoring adjacent wetlands to improve habitat and provide flood storage, and minimizing conditions that could result in the spread of undesirable invasive species and managing existing invasive populations, right? So this really touches on a lot of the issues that we heard through the public meeting last time about invasive species, about the low flow conditions, and about the fisheries. Um, so just trying to capture those in various kind of specific language that is about what we're trying to achieve. Um, we also have some project objectives that are specific to the infrastructure and operational kind of objectives of the project. Um, a really important one, which is, um, you know, I know we've been in a period of drought, so it's hard to kind of kind of reinforce this, but we have to think about flood risks um, to the infrastructure and property along the river. 
um, improving the ability to manage the water levels in the Aswamsit Pond to help ensure water supply and minimize safety risk to workers. And then reducing the ongoing maintenance by working with the river morphology, right? So our goal with this planning process is really to take a holistic, long kind of term perspective on this in order to be proposing things that will not require, you know, kind of constant maintenance, but actually we're working with the river morphology, with the kind of the nature of what the river wants to do in order to um, kind of ensure that it's able to maintain itself, right? And put things in, in place that could help it to maintain itself over time. There also are social objectives. Um, some, a very important one is obviously about enhancing the quality and quantity of recreation on the river. This is obviously related to low flow conditions, but also in terms of the river channel. Um, and then also just thinking about how we can improve stewardship through education events and outreach, which are important and already exist. There are already some great events that exist on the river, like the Herring Festival that the Herring Commission puts on and others, um, but trying to figure out how can we, how does what we do on the river, how can that help to build that stewardship of the river? And then um, lastly are the economic objectives, just thinking about how we could, you know, minimizing construction costs within the context of other project objectives. Um, and what we mean by that is, you know, our goal um, is not just to do the cheapest solution, but actually to kind of think about what it is that, that achieves most of our project objectives and how do we begin to balance that with the cost um, and figure out where we could fund, how, where and how we could fund these projects. Um, and then obviously also thinking about long-term costs for the ongoing operations and maintenance within the context of other project objectives. So similarly, you know, thinking first and foremost about which alternatives actually meet the most of the project objectives and then figuring out how to balance that with the cost. Um, and so, like I said, you know, these were developed um, from the last public meeting, our input from the conversation of the steering committee, but really one of our main goals for, for today is to get your input um, here on the call about whether you feel like these are, um, these are the right objectives, if there's any we're missing, if there's any wording that you think would be helpful to, to shift in order to capture the issues that you think are really important here on the river. So we're looking forward to um, engaging you all in a conversation about this um, in, in, in the next few minutes here. Um, but before we do that, um, we're going to jump over to Neil, who's going to present on the hydrologic and hydraulic model. Um, this is a bit of a recap also from the last public meeting, but just want to make sure that everybody understands what it is that we will be modeling in the, this next stage of the project and where and how the alternatives will, it will help to, to understand how the different alternatives are meeting the different project objectives. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to Neil to present on this and then the alternative packages. Thank you, Emily. Uh, when don't you go to the next slide, please? So I'm gonna breeze through this a little quicker than the last time, recognizing that a fair amount of the folks on the call tonight were also on, on the last one, but feel free at the end of this, there'll be uh, an opportunity to ask questions about the model. And then at the end of the discussion of alternatives, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions then as well as in the breakout group. So. If I go over anything too quickly, you, you'll have an opportunity to ask me for a little bit more detail. So um, we are going to be evaluating how water moves through this project area using something we call a hydrologic and hydraulic model. And it's as simple as the hydrology, hydrology component is how much water is available in the river from ultimately from rain originally. All of it is, is rain, whether it be direct rain, runoff from storms, groundwater, overflow from the pond and the dam. It's, it's how much water is available in the river at different times. And then the hydraulics are how, how, does that, how is that water manifest in the river channel in the floodplain? So how deep is the water? How fast is it flowing? How wide is the river from one side to the other under these various hydrologic conditions and at different places up and downstream along the river? And we, we do this model uh, with a computer program called HECRAS, which is a US Army Corps of Engineer developed uh, program stretching back some 40 years and with many, many iterations and refinements since then. And it just stands for Hydrologic Engineering Center, which is the department of the US Army Corps of Engineers that does this stuff. And RAS is River Analysis System. So the computer program is called HECRAS for short. Um, and it uses input hydrology, like I said, for example, the 100 year storm event. So this, when, when FEMA does flood studies, they use HECRAS models and they are almost solely concerned with this 100 year storm event. So what, 
what how what properties will flood, what will the river look like under a hundred year event. Um, but we can do, and we will do various other hydrologic components, you know, two year storms, five year storms, and something we call um, flow exceedance durations. So what that means is how often is any given flow exceeded over the long term record. So something like a 5% exceedance means it's only exceeded has only been exceeded 5% of the time. So that's a very high flow. Only 5% of the flows have ever been higher than that 5% exceedance flow. And the other end of the spectrum that we commonly look at is the 90% exceedance flow. So that means the flows under that condition are exceeded 90% of the time, almost always. So those are very low flow conditions. And we, we look at that for fish passage concerns. Um, so once you have this hydrology, the, the hydraulics of the river are controlled by the cross-sectional geometry of the river itself and its surrounding floodplain that the water has to flow through. So, you know, where, where the channel is confined into small, a small geometric cross-section, the river flows faster. Where it's broad, it flows slower. And the more cross-sections that you use, the more accurate the model is, because it's essentially just doing math at each of these cross-sections and forcing the water from upstream to downstream through each of these sections. And we're going to use this model to evalu evaluate potential alterations along the river corridor. And this will likely include things like the two dams, uh, the various bridges along the way, uh, potential channel modifications. So that means the shape, the geometry of the river channel, how wide and deep it is, and how it's connected to its floodplain, dredging opportunities, and even changes in the floodplain. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. So here's a we um, our model is a derived, more detailed subset of the model that FEMA, the, the Federal Hazard Agency, uses for this. I mentioned that hundred-year flood. So when they, your insurance and all of that stuff is dictated by these FEMA models of the hundred-year storm. So there is one for the Namaskit River, and we are refining that for our purposes. So this slide is just showing the extent of the original FEMA model. So each of those green lines on the right, that's a plan view looking down from space at the river from the pond to the Taunton River. Each of those green lines is a cross section in the model. And then on the left is a, is a um, slice, a, a, a profile view of the river. So if you were, the, the plan view on the right, if you were standing on the left, looking into the river as if you could like look down into the ground, this would be that. So the right side is the Asawamsit Pond Dam up high, and then the, the low side, the left side at, the lo at lower is the Taunton River. So this is showing the fall of the river as it, as it flows downstream from Asawamsit Pond to the Taunton. And you, one thing you should notice here is how shallow the grade of the stream is for that first part, which is roughly from the Aswamsa Pond to the Wareham Street Dam, and then it gets much steeper uh, further on. So the, there's a, been an artificial condition created by that Wareham Street Dam that has made the river grade shallower than it would normally have been. Um, next, please, Emily. Uh, so we, to, for our purposes, because we're looking at a smaller area and we want as much detail as possible, we cut this model down to focus solely on the area from Aswamsa Pond down to Route 105 in Middleborough. Um, we added a bunch of new uh, cross sections cross transects into the model to add more detail. These include eight transects for the immediate about 500 feet immediately below the Aswamsa Pond Dam. And these were field surveyed transects, so highly accurate to you know hundreds of a foot uh, at each spot along the way. Um, additional survey a field, highly accurate field survey at the uh, railroad bridge and at the area of the Wareham Street Dam and for the impoundment area upstream of that. Um, so all that went into the revised model. Next, please. So here's a little picture of, of the, the model screen for the area uh, immediately below Aswamsa Pond Dam. And you can see the at the bottom of the screen, is the pond itself. And then you see the river channel going uh, in the blue line, the edges of the river channel on the red line, and then the left to right 
light green, creme green lines are the various cross sections that we added into the model um, through there. Um, I should mention this, so we talk here about this something called LIDAR data. So LIDAR stands for light detection and raging. So this is a reasonably new within the last 20 years technology that has been uh, being done. So essentially you, uh, airplanes fly over and shoot hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, LIDAR, of uh, laser beams down from the, the airplane to the ground and record the time it takes for those beams to hit something and bounce back. And then detailed software can process the time differences for how long that takes to figure out topography of the ground. It can tell where trees are or houses or the ground surface, all that stuff um, to give you a not quite field survey accuracy, but a, but a pretty about one to two foot contour interval accuracy for topography. So we're using that too to help um, fill in the model for areas where we don't have field data. The, the one I should mention, the one shortcoming of LIDAR is it's very poor at penetrating the water surface. So you can't get below water level uh, bathymetry from, from LIDAR. Next, please. Um, this is just a picture of the existing dam for the Asawamsa Pond. And this, this was field surveyed by Outback Engineering. So this is, this is going in, this is, an up, this is a better, more updated version than what the FEMA model has. And this has got, gone into our um, local scale model for this project. Next, please. So let's, it was a little fast and probably a lot, but we'll take a short break if anyone wants to ask a model specific question at this point. Hey. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Norm Arl here. Um, have you only modeled existing conditions or have you started looking at any? So far, we've only modeled existing conditions and we're kind of tweaking that a little bit and we have not moved into the alternatives analysis yet. So we're kind of, probably we're just not there yet. And also we're kind of waiting for the feedback from this public meeting to make sure we're on the right track with the various alternatives that we have in mind to, to run. Are you seeing um, any, any information uh, of coming from the crossings, the bridge crossings, or, or, are you seeing any choke points? I guess the question would be in the model uh, when you run it at the, at the various bridge crossings. Right, so that you're, you're right on target for how we, what we look at when we do this stuff here. So we're still looking at that. So we're kind of in the preliminary stages, but the short answer is yes, that many, or most of those crossings are hydraulic restriction points to various degrees. And you'll see when we start talking about these alternatives um, that th those crossings are a prime focus of things we wanna look at for potential fixes. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So Emily, let's move on, I guess. Yeah, so, so now very, very nice. Um, Segue, Representative Orwell, for uh, moving into the alternatives here. So um, we'll start with these, these principles, right? That, that, and Emily mentioned this at the beginning, but we're, we're trying to take a holistic approach to the river. So instead of just trying to slap a Band-Aid on one particular spot and try to fix something in the short term, we're trying to look at the entire river as a system, how it works and what what approach and combination of approaches might best allow the system to function uh, better for both for you know uh, ecology for fish and other organisms and for people uh, and with a low maintenance as low a maintenance burden as possible on it and, and the way you do that is you work with the river morphology instead of fighting it so you try to you try to make rivers have evolved throughout the world and in this place no different than anywhere else um, to fall into sync or to, to reflect the hydrology and the land surface that they are on. So the, the shape of the river, the, the type, the size of the channel, the depth, how it meanders, its gradient, all of that evolves over thousands of years based on the specific conditions where that river is. So the closer you can get a river back to that, the more sustainably it will function with the least intervention going forward. And really what we're talking about here is kind of, you know, for hundreds of years before recently, 
we as a culture kind of did things that were not working with the river morphology. We were, do, we were doing the exact opposite. We were changing the morphology and that had unintended consequences that we didn't realize at that time, but has led to problems that we're dealing with now and why we're even having this project and talking about things. So we're, we're trying to fix that. Um, I guess that's good enough for that. Next, please, Emily. Uh, so we've had this slide up before. So this is just showing the various elements that we will be looking at uh, for the alternative. So the two dams at the upstream and downstream end, the various bridge crossings in between, and uh, river channel changes. And we're really only looking at the area immediately below the Aswamps of Pond for, for that, for the river channel modifications here. Uh, next, please. So we have 20 total alternatives that we're looking at. And, and why there's 20 is, well, there always has to be a number, right? Every project has a budget and there's, there's only so much that you can do. So 20 is the number that we're, we're doing here. And we've broken those into these four kind of um, buckets. And so there's there are alternatives within each of those buckets, and then there are also alternatives that kind of blend together items from each of these four separate buckets. So now we'll go into the, um, the more specific alternatives that we've got here. Um, so, and this is where, the, so th this is kind of a lot. At the, at the end of all of this, there'll be a slide summarizing all of this stuff, and we'll have that in the breakout groups. So it will help, it'll help us all when we talk about it later. But, um, each of these next series of slides will go into a little bit of detail about the various groups of alternatives. So the first four revolve around the Aswamsa Pond Dam itself. So this is really about what configuration of the dam, and by the dam, I don't mean just the current structure with the five bays and the, and the fish ladder that's made of stone that you see now. I mean that, that and the entire um, earthen berm that is essentially holding up the pond at a higher elevation than it would have naturally been. So how, what series of alterations to that, you know, number of openings, size of openings, um, overflow channels through that earthen berm, et cetera, what combination of those will best allow um, appropriate management of water levels, both in the pond and letting flow out of the pond to go into the river? Um, so that's the first start. So this is really how much water is going to be available in the river. So we got we're looking at four options there, and we'll move on. You know the other options all build off of that. So this next set scenarios five to seven are you take whatever the most um, advantageous dam configuration is, and then you combine that with up to three possibilities for how that channel immediately below the dam might be configured. So this is something like, you know, the, the width of a channel and the depth, how it might bend or meander, its gradient, how it connects to the floodplain and the wetlands around it. So three options of those to combine with that selected dam alternative to, again, as we're working downstream here to begin seeing what's the best option for that first uppermost stretch of river. And then we'll build off of that again, moving further downstream. So next, please. Um, this one stays in that same area. So this, this is something that's been um, independently talked about for decades and is now being talked about by the, by the Herring Commission. So we want to put that in here too. So this is a, a, what's called a silt trap and channel dredge. So the idea here would be to kind of restore the channel to the dredge condition, the artificial dredge condition that it was, or something close to that, when the dam was first built approximately 100 years ago. So this isn't, we're not, we're not talking about a, a natural channel or whatever existed before the dam. This is the artificial an idea to just remove excess sediment and try to take the channel back to that artificial condition of 100 years ago, and also to add a, essentially a, a, a hole, a, a, a retention pond hole to trap some of the sediment coming down so, so that the sediment could be periodically excavated out of that hole and prevent it from moving further down river. So this is just a kind of a standalone set of alternatives, a one, one alternative that we'll be looking at in the model as well. Uh, next, please. And then moving further downstream, 
we um, we've got a few options that we are considering. So this is, I guess, four potential options here um, for bridge crossings. So and these we're looking at first off, we're looking at them on their own. So so in this entire, I should step back a bit. This entire configuration of alternatives, we're trying to first look at individual things on their own so we can understand their individual impacts and, and potential fixes. And then also later look at potential combinations thereof. So this set of packages focuses solely on bridges. So you leave all the dams alone, don't, don't touch them, don't do anything to them. Just, just if we did nothing but alter a bridge or four bridges, what, what would happen? So, um, you know, we, we can talk more about this for if we've got the right choices here, but we've, we're going to look at the old bridge street uh, on its own. And, and the rationale behind for, for that is A, it's one of the smaller crossings, so it's a significant constriction point, and B, it's not used. So it's taking it down doesn't have the same cost or impacts or anything that a, that a, a, a currently used bridge would have. Um, then we picked the MBTA bridge because it's another one of the smaller ones and, a, and another one of the more uh, serious constriction points. And we also have a lot of really good field survey data there. So we picked that one. And then we, we've yet to pick the other three bridges. So we, we can talk about those, uh, what, what we think those best ones are to move forward. Uh, next, please. And then the next, um, the next one on, on its own is the Wareham Street Dam. And this is realistically probably the most important one of all of these things, because um, it's become clear to me that the Wareham Street Dam is the most controlling factor on the upper river. So we'll look at that on its own, and, and really we're looking at just, just, just one option, just you know, leave it as it is or take it out. Um, the reason for that is because the, the dam isn't really serving any functional purpose now. So there's not really, you, you either leave it because you know you want the current situation or you take it out. There's not a lot of rationale or reason for spending money to modify it in some way. So those it's really it's a it's an in or out option for, for the Wareham Street Dam. Um, I guess these are just some pictures of another dam removal project that I was not involved in, so I don't really have a lot to say about it other than here's some, some pictures showing uh, passage through time of an impoundment starting on the upper left. So there's a dam that's not seen, but holding back that water there. And then you can see it's, it gets removed um, in November 2012 going clockwise and, uh, well, not, I guess not clockwise, left to right top and left to right bottom. So various stages of return to um, a natural river after dam removal. And I guess the thinking here is this is just one example that perhaps the Wareham Street Dam might look like, although we really don't know at this point what the Wareham Street Dam might look like once it's removed. Um, then we have uh, the next set of alternatives is kind of combining some things, right? So now what if we do whatever selected choice is being done to both dams and um, also do the selected modification to the upper river channel immediately below Assawampsit Pond. What happens then? So that's, that's the next set, scenario 15. Next, please. Then, okay, so what if we only do the Assawampsit Pond Dam in the upper river, upper river channel and pick one select bridge to add, what, what happens then? So in this one, we're leaving the Wareham Street Dam alone. But again, the idea here is to look at all the feasible things and see what their, both their individual and, and select combinations of impacts might be. Next, please. This one, we don't touch the Assawampsit Pond Dam, but this time we take down the Wareham Street Dam and do one bridge. So what are the impacts of that? Uh, next, please. This one, we kind of pull a lot of like really um, probably, you know, high, highly likely to have high impact options together into one package where we take out both dams or not take out, we, we do the selected modification to both dams, plus the river channel immediately below Aswamsa Pond, plus one select bridge. We put all that together. What are the impacts of that on the river? Next, please. And, and that's the end of it. So that's through all of those 
complicated gymnastics. There are 20 total uh, model alternatives being run there. And this slide is a summary of that. So I'm not going to read it, but I'll kind of leave it on the screen for a few seconds. And this will come up again in we, when we go to our breakouts and we can use that to talk about if, you know, did we miss something important? Um, is one of these these packages not doesn't make sense. We do something different. All that kind of stuff is on the table. I think that might be the end of this. Yes. Thank you, Neil. Um, Lee, I see you have a question before we move on. Yeah. Um, so um, I've heard in the past folks say the dam, the the last dam there, um, at the Wareham Street Dam. Is that the bascule? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I've heard it said both ways that um, that dam can regulate the entire Assawampsit and the, you know, if we would just keep it all the way down, it would take care of the problem. I've heard it the other way. It doesn't really make a difference. It seems like Neil had a pretty strong opinion um, that he just said um, that you didn't it's either or you either keep it in not modify it or take it out can you just elaborate a little bit more on that yeah so i guess the thinking one of the options that were talked about uh in the steering committee was what would it make sense to build a what's called a nature like fishway passage on the side so there's currently a fish uh, fish ladder there so could you build something a lot more elaborate to allow for better fish passage, but still leave the dam up. And the thinking from everyone involved on the steering committee was that was probably not a smart expenditure of money because it would be almost, if not more expensive than taking the, the dam down entirely. And all it would do is improve fish passage to some degree over what is apparently already a, a reasonably functional fish ladder that's there. And it wouldn't address any of the issues about sedimentation or flow or invasive species or any of that other stuff that goes on. So it, it has a, a limited set of benefits for very high cost. So that, that was the thinking for not having that in as, a, as an option here. Okay. All right. Leah, but I think you bring up a really important point, you know, which is um, really one of the main reasons why the um, why we're running the H and H model, is that the H and H model will help us to better understand what the impact of that would be of the removal would be on the water, right? Uh, levels both in the upper channel but also downstream, and so that's really the main goal of doing of doing the H and H model is to better understand what those implications would be. Yeah, um, and, and like I said, I've heard you know I've heard it from different people. You know, and and if we lower it all the way and leave it down, then the river will flow better. Um, but again, you know, I think we all know that that that's every, it, there's a whole bunch of things that are wrong. I don't think there's any one, you know. Um, but I, it just seemed like there's a little more um, thought process to the to the dam. We either keep it there or we get rid of it, but not try to improve it. So for me, that was a new, if I missed that along the way somewhere, but it was a little bit new for me tonight. Yeah, this is the real benefit of this model is it'll remove the speculation, right? So we'll, okay. or at least to yeah. some degree, you know, we'll have, yeah. we'll, we'll understand better what the impacts are rather than just having to guess about it. Yeah, and that, that, that would be great. So thank you. Excellent. So we have one um, more question, but um, we're going to actually be dividing up shortly into groups in order to have a more in-depth conversation about the alternatives. Um, if we have any kind of pressing questions about the alternative packages, we can talk about it right now just to get clarification from Neil about it. Um, but if not, we will have more chance to discuss it moving forward. Um, well, I, I just have one question. Um, do we know what any of these alternatives will actually do or is... Uh, um, uh, it seems like a lot of different plans here, and are they based on um, what's the predictability of um, uh, the outcome of these um, changes? So the, the model for, for each of these alternative packages here, the model will tell us what the river elevation and 
flow velocity will be at each of the 100 plus cross sections in, in the river um, from upstream to downstream under different flow conditions. So under different storm events, low drought conditions, high flow, et cetera. So we will, it allow us to estimate what the river will look like if each of these packages were done. Excellent, thank you. And we'll take one more question from Representative Oral before we move into the breakout groups. Oh, great, thank you. So just to clarify on, on Leah's question, about the Baskill Dam at Wareham Street. At this point, the, we haven't done the modeling to see if it has an effect on right. water levels at, okay, mm -hmm. at ponds. And just as a note, um, uh, Middleborough has stated in the past, they use it to control the level of water at a well. That might be something to look at. Um, and it's also used in order for the fish ladder to work, to impound enough water for it to actually flow through the fish ladder is my understanding. And then lastly, if you are looking for another bridge crossing possibly Vaughn Street, where the old bridge stone abutments were left underneath the new bridge when that was done in the early 2000s, um, possibly, uh, the way that the current bridge sits, it might afford the ability to remove um, the old abutments that are left underneath it to widen the crossing to the new bridge. That's just as an idea for if you're looking for another bridge crossing to to look at. Yeah, that's that's good to know. And. Um... You know, and we can talk about that further in the breakouts. But yeah, and the other good thing about Vaughn Street is compared to some of the other roads, it's relatively small. So the, you know, the cost and the effort required to replace that would be less than, you know, for example, Route 495, which would be really out of the question. There's just too much, too much involved in that to, to bite into. Excellent. Um, so with that, we're going to move into our um, breakout groups. And I think, um, you know, the main goal is just to hear more from you all and to make sure that everybody has a chance to share their ideas and reflections on, um, on the material that we've presented so far. Um, so there's two main questions that we're going to be asking during the breakout groups. Um, the first is about the project objectives um, and whether or not you all feel that the project objectives capture the issues that you think are most important when considering the future of the Upper Namaskit River. And while we're discussing that, that, um, you know, really the idea is, you know, here we are today, you know, what are our goals moving forward in terms of where we want to get to um, with the Upper Namaskit River Enhancement Plan and the future of the river. Um, and we will have the objectives up on the screen again for that discussion so you could refer back to them and remember because I know that it was a lot that we just shared. Um, and then the second thing that we'll be discussing is if you have any questions about the alternative packages and if there are any alternatives that we're missing, right? So any suggestions like um, Representative Oral mentioned about the bridge crossings or anything else that you all have that you have um, questions about or want to share um, in terms of these different um, packages, that'd be great. Um, and I think the challenge and the interesting part of working on the river is that there's a lot of interconnected decisions that we're talking about. And that's one of the main reasons why we're thinking about them in these packages. I know it's a lot to try to kind of understand in the short meeting, um, but really that's the, that's the goal of this is really to kind of think about these um, both individually, but then these kind of packages that begin to um, put different combinations together. Um, so with that, um, we are going to um, um, set up, the breakout rooms are now set up. And so shortly you should receive um, this little message on your screen. And if you could just press the join button, we'll be divided into two groups to have discussions um, about these two questions that we just asked. Um, and then we will come back together in the main group um, in about 25 minutes, um, 30 minutes in order to then talk about the next steps in the third public meeting that'll be coming up shortly. So with that, Danik, if you wanna divide us up, that'd be great. So just press join when you receive this message on your screen. Sure, I'm gonna do, do you want me to set it to 25 minutes so we have time to come back for a wrap up? Does that sound? Yes, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and actually, Danica, all... we, could, we could do 30, we could do 30 minutes just to make sure that we have enough time to talk about things. Okay. So I'll do 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to move you all automatically. Last time, um, we had some issues with the, um, 
individual. So I'm just going to move everyone uh, automatically. So you shouldn't have to do anything. And I will send like a five minute warning before we come back. Thank you, Danica. No problem. See you all in a moment. Okay, so you, those of you who are here, this is gonna be a separate big breakout group. You didn't have to move, um, but this will be our discussion here. Um, and Neil and Maria, since we had fewer groups than we needed, um, if you both wanna facilitate together or you can choose if just one of you wants to facilitate, but I'll take notes in this room. Okay, great. So we're all, the three of us will be here then for the, the whole- Yes, weekend. yeah, the okay, three of great. us will be here. Great. Um, and aside from that, I think everyone is sorted, so we should be good to go. Okay, great. And will you record, or do you want me to record? Does it matter? Um, I'll, re I'll record. Okay, great. Neil, I think we can kind of go back and forth on this, and I think we're going to get a lot of questions about the alternatives, so um, yeah. it's great that you're here. Um, so, hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to our breakout group. Uh, before we get started, um, I know many of you are likely already on our email list, but if, if you'd like to get added to our email list and you're not already, you can just add your email in the chat box, or I can also put our group email in the chat. I'll do that now. So you can also just email us and we'll add you to the chat. Um, so I'll do that now. There we go. And so before we jump in, we just want to do some uh, quick introductions. Um, and basically, we'll just kind of say who we are and a little our connection or background to the Namaskit River. So I'll start. I'm Maria Gabriel. I'm freshwater manager with the Nature Conservancy. And I started on the project team just about a year ago. So I'm excited to be here working here. Um, and my connection to the Namaskit is that I was formerly an aquatic ecologist and I managed um, all rare freshwater mussel conservation work in the watershed. That's my background. Um, Danica, you want to? You already introduced yourself, I think, but maybe not. Refresh again. <laughs> um, sure. So I'm Danica. Hello, nice to meet you all, um, and see you all again for those who I've already met. I work with Mass Audubon. I'm a climate resilience coordinator, so I work in our um, the southeast region of Massachusetts. Um, and I'm also working to help um, manage this project with the SNEP network. Neil, you, you, I think you pretty well introduced yourself. Yeah, I think I'm for me already. I can skip this part. <laughs> so if we want to go around, uh, maybe I'll just call on people that I can see. Tom, if you want to. Well, I'm Tom Barron. I'm from the uh, Middleborough Lakeville Herring Fisheries Herring Commission. And We've been working with the river for a number of years. Yeah, yeah. Tom's work is great. Um, and Suzanne? Uh, yes, I am uh, live on Long Pond. Um, we, had, we came here summers uh, since 1991. And um, in 2016, well, well, 17, I guess we moved here year round. So I, I really didn't know that much about anything <laughs> as a summer person, except that I know that the um, the water between Long Pond and Assawamset is not what it used to be. That I used mm -hmm. to kayak there. So that, that's my experience. And that the, the, and the flooding of Long Pond, um, mm -hmm. which I don't think as a non-resident, I ever really fully understood mm -hmm. what happened yeah. there. Um, a lot of rumors, but nothing that I know for sure. Mm -hmm. so, Curiosity. Great. Thank you. Uh, Nancy? Um, Nancy Yates. I'm the environmental manager of the Aswamps of Pond Complex. And actually, over the last 20 years, in the many roles I've had uh, living in Lakeville, my main focus has always been water, water yeah. protection. Great. Thank you. And Rep Oral, I mean, I'm sure many of us know of you, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm Representative Norman Oral, so lifelong, mostly, most of my life, resident of Lakeville, and uh, grew up using the Namaskit uh, 
canoe and recreate and fish. And uh, also a civil engineer who's done uh, some of these studies. So I guess that's why I'm, I'm anxious to move ahead and see some, <laughs> see some of the, the uh, results of the study um, and the modeling. So uh, I've looked at it myself uh, since the 2010 flooding, um, the crossings and so forth with the Namaskit and just tried, been multiple times brainstorming as to what, yeah. what might be the issue. And I'm glad that we finally have this study underway so we can get some data to actually make decisions by. Yeah, great. Okay, Jen, I don't know if you can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I'm Jen uh, Freitas Carter. I grew up on the river. Uh, my family owns quite a bit of land on the river. Um, so that's kind of my stake in it. Um, you know, we take the kids canoeing quite frequently. And um, even just on a recent trip, just always amazed at how little water flow there is in the river, um, even up by the dam. So, yep, great. And Mike, you're muted. <laughs> uh, I, I'm here representing the Lakeville Open Space Committee. Uh, I live on the river, actually across the street from the Freitas uh, property. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, this year we've been kayaking um, as much of the river as we possibly can, the, the whole thing. I actually haven't done the, uh, from Namaskit up, but I mean, from the Vaughn Street up, but mm -hmm. we will. Mm -hmm. Well, with all our water this, this summer so far, it might be a good time to get out there. <laughs> uh, let's see, we did Suzanne, you went, Jen, you went, um, Adam. Hi, I'm Adam Barkley. I live on Vaughn Street, actually, right, <laughs> right next to Mike. Um, I'm a fisheries biologist in a former life, and um, my property is right, right next to Mike. So, and to get in a sense for uh, mm. exactly what's going on and, and how we can uh, make a difference here. Great. And, and Sean and Kevin, I know you're with Lake Cam. Um, do you both want to introduce Sean? Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Sean Rutledge. Uh, I'm just with Lake Cam. We're recording and live streaming everything, helping, you know, get the word out about the, you know, this workshop and everything. Great. Love hearing about all, all the things happening. Great. Thank you. And thanks for doing all the work. Kevin, did you want to add any, anything? I could say the same thing Sean did. I'm just here to help you guys out and <laughs> help you guys get the word out. Great. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate that. It's great to meet everyone or re-meet them. So as Emily mentioned, there were two main questions that we really want to, you know, touch on today and get your, your input, a little more, uh, you know, focused uh, discussion. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see here. Open this up first. So we can see the objectives again. Okay, and can everybody see this? I hope. Yeah, we see your slide. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'll 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 re I'll repeat the question that Emily shared. So again, here are the project objectives, and the question is: Do the project objectives capture the issues that you think are important when considering the future of the Upper Namaskit River? And I can put that. I can also put that in the chat if that's helpful. Um, so just, you know, reminding you all that, you know, as Emily said, these are the specific issues that we're trying to address with this project. Um, so kind of where we'd like to be at the end of the project. And I, if it's helpful, I can, I can kind of quickly read through these again. Emily just did. Um, I don't want to waste too much of our time, but I'll just quickly go through. So again, the ecological objectives. Um, to improve uh, passage of adult and juvenile herring and other anadromous fish. Uh, second one, enhance water quality for drinking water and ecosystem health. Improve low flow aquatic connectivity. Restore adjacent wetlands to improve habitat and, and provide flood storage. 
and to minimize conditions that could result in the spread of undesirable invasive species and manage existing invasive populations. So we've heard this repeatedly um, at, you know, at the public meeting, uh, at our first public meeting and from the steering committee. So uh, I'll just move through all of these and then we can you know, go back and see um, if people feel that these address everything appropriately, if there's anything that should be added. So infrastructural and operational objectives, again, to minimize flood risk and whoopsie, flood risk and infrastructure and pro, um, to, for infrastructure and property, uh, improve the ability to manage water levels in the, in the pond to help ensure water supply and minimize safety risk to workers. Reduce ongoing maintenance by working with the river morphology as Neil was explaining. And then social objectives, to enhance quality and quantity of recreation on the river, improve stewardship through education, events, and outreach, and then oops, economic objectives. So minimize construction costs within the context of other project objectives, and minimize long-term costs for ongoing operations and maintenance within the context of other project objectives. So again, the question is, do these objectives capture the issues that you think are important when you're considering the future of the Upper Namaskit? So please feel free to just speak up. You can, we can all take ourselves off mute if, that, um, if that's you know, easier for a conversation. This is just supposed to be a free flowing conversation and Danica is gonna try to take some notes and capture um, any, any important um, information that you have to add. Can I say something about the uh ecological objectives yeah um you're saying um to improve the passage um improve low flow restore adjacent well improve habitat provide flood storage minimize conditions you're not and you know, especially um minimize conditions that could result in the spread of undesirable invasive species there's nowhere there that's actually calling out Let's get rid of the invasive. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of dancing all around it, but nothing says let's. We really need to get the invasive species out before you could think about minimizing conditions for you know the spread once they're gone or before they come back. Or mm -hmm. I mean, it all points to that, but it doesn't absolutely say it. Yeah, about getting rid of. The invasives, we've had a big problem lately, like in Long Pond, where they just were trying to figure out how to get rid of the invasive <clears throat> species. But that in itself is a whole clump of a whole bad thing. Right. And you know, and sorry, Tom, you wanted to add on to that. Go, go ahead. As far as the invasive species, first of all, I want to say uh, first to Jen Freitas and her family, um, we're working on a project to remove some of the milfoil and it's scheduled for later this year, later in August, August 3rd, 4th and 5th, to get an echo harvester in there to remove some of it. And I'm thanking Jen Freitas because her family owns the land, the old uh, area where they used to test the fire engines and whatever. That's where they're gonna deposit the wheat and stuff there. And Jen Freitas is right. See, Marie, you think there's a lot of water in the river right now but there's not. Jen Freitas has lived there her whole life. And what happens is in June, when they board up the Namaskit Dam, it, it stops the flow. The only flow that's going in there now is from the, the Herring Run, okay? That's the only water that's going in. Any other water that's going into that river is not coming from As Asawansett Pond. It's coming from the swamp and the wetlands. So there, there isn't a lot of water there. If you had seen the river in 2010, 11, and 12, You'd say there's a lot of water there when we had the floods. Mm -hmm. but, but what happens is because Asawamsit Pond is used strictly as a water reservoir, they control it. And that's the headwaters of the river. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, I, I know there's a lot of discussion about these dams. And as far as the dams go, when there's low water in 2016 and 2021, you couldn't get any water out of the ponds. Hi, good, how are you? In the flood years in 2010, once the groundwater comes up on the other side of Asawamsit Pond in the swamp and whatever, you can't get the water out of the river. 
So the Baskill Dam and the, the Masket Dam, they're not entities in flood conditions, they don't work. The problem is getting the sand and the invasive weeds and everything out of the river so you can move water and, and widening the channel so you can move water from dam to dam. Uh, again, Chris Peck from, well, he used to be the Lakeville DPW person. Now he's in Middleborough. He lowered the water in 2011. And what happens at the Baskill Dam, when you, when you lower that dam all the way, the river drains up for 200 feet and that's it. Not a drop of water moves from the up in the Masket, up by the dam area. Who is that, you know? Fisheries and wildlife. I, I, I mean, not, not fisheries and wildlife, a herring. Now, all that, all that happened is it just, all the plants grew up and everything. It just, it doesn't drain it. So the problem is the river is clogged with a with hundred and something years of sedimentation and the invasive weeds. Right, and to get to, thanks for all of that. And to get to um, the, the first point about the you know not having the actual removal of the invasives on this list and and that would be probably in a separate and Neil and Danica please chime in but um you know in our holistic watershed management plan uh, you know because the model isn't getting at how we're going to actually remove invasives that are there already the model is actually getting at conditions you know understanding the conditions and the flow and re reduction of sediment that will ho hopefully in you know create conditions that will not be as hospitable to invasives. So I think I think removal is probably a separate issue that would not necessarily be part of the modeling and, and this piece. Definitely important, but, but but I think separate. Neil, what is that what would you would also say as far as the modeling and the in this project objectives right now? That's correct, Maria. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. And any other issues that people see missing from any part of this list, not just the ecological? Um, the, sorry, go ahead. Uh, what the safety risk to workers means? Yes, I can answer that question. It, it's the workers when they go out to put the boards in the dam, oh, they yeah. have to put down an aluminum plank and they walk across it and they have to lift up the heavy wooden boards one of the things that <clears throat> Gary Santos from the New Bedford Water Department has asked for before they spend millions of dollars trying to do anything to the dam, if they could just get some decent boards to put in there and to minimize the safety of the two workers that have to go and stand on each rock structure to lift it up and bring it over. If they had, because the boards they have now, they have like a two inch hole in them that they use to put a hook in to lift them up. And that two inches allows water in. So basically it's allowing a lot of water into the river in the first place. But that, that's the safety issues for the workers that raise and lower the boards on the dam. Okay, thank you. So I, I should point out, just like the invasive species issue, that really isn't part of this study. I mean, it, it is ultimately in terms of whatever happens to the dam, but we do not have the ability with this modeling study to look at how the dam will be, you know, how boards go in and go out. We're, we're simply looking at the size of the openings and how much water can flow through them. So that's really a, a later thing uh, to, to be dealt with. So it's not, not really part of this. So retrofitting wouldn't be a part of it? Well, retrofitting in terms of changing the size of the openings would be. But in terms of how those, you know, like how boards go in and go out, that would not be part of it. Okay, because I think that the people that actually do that work it is their opinion that uh, retrofitting would really help them and minimize the risk. Yep, certainly understood. And it would need to be, if anything gets done to the dam, then those other other issues about how would the you know, operational stuff comes into play, but in terms of like right now, we're just looking at how do the hydraulics of the river change for different openings of the dam. So you know how so the the, the way that boards go in and out doesn't affect that. So it's not part of this study. So Neil, is it the, the this we're focusing on what what things could improve? So these objectives are just guiding 
um, what you're looking at in, in the modeling um, to pursue. Uh, and then once, once you've identified uh, these items that will improve the flow to, to meet or meet all of these objectives in various ways, once the is done for that, then there would be a project or multiple projects put forward. Let's say one is retrofit the dam and, and at Aswamsett, and that's when we would get into the details of, a, of what that would look like, what the dam, new dam or retrofitted dam would look like, how they would, uh, what would be necessary. So that this step here is just simply to look at the, the hydraulic, hydrologic modeling exactly right exactly. these objectives are what you're pursuing when you're modeling different scenarios right so the, the point of these objectives these are like guiding principles that led into the um selection of the alternatives that we're going to talk about next so i guess the, the, what we shall be thinking about with these objectives is are these the right things to be thinking about when we look at various alternatives and and i think i think you've captured the objective is quite, uh, I don't, I can't think of anything to add to it. I think through your work and through the previous public meetings, uh, I think you've captured them myself. Yeah, I mean, these basically are kind of, you know, a summary of all the different concerns that we've heard and, and, you know, the, the locations and things like that. So, um, and then with the results of the modeling, we can then more, you know, we can evaluate all the different strategies and then kind of prioritize and rank them and, and move forward. Um, so we don't run out of time. I, I, what I'll do is I'll move, we can come back to this, but I'll move to the next slide and the second question, unless anyone else has some other things they wanna add here, please feel free. Okay. Hearing nothing, we will move on to, okay, now here are those alternative packages. And I know, you know, I know they can be a little overwhelming and what I thought I might do quickly, I'll just read you the question. Are there any questions about the alternative packages? Are there any alternatives or packages that we are missing? And I just thought I might share, I, I think, I, I'm sure everyone understands this, but it's hard to, um, you know, fully, comprehend everything broken down like that. And I thought I might just quickly share, uh, this slide was up um, during the presentation, but basically what it shows you is the, al the alternatives that we're considering at, at each um, uh, component of the work. So, you know, below the dam, you know, or at the dam, do nothing, replace or modify the dam, restore the hydrological connection to the wetlands through the berm, or the set and or the sediment trap. So those are the alternatives basically to address, you know, to, to be proposed at the, at the dam. Uh, in the river channel, we can do nothing. You can dredge the channel. You can reconnect the river to the adjacent wetlands and floodplain or redesign the river channel, narrowing it and, and making it a bit deeper. At the bridge crossings, again, you can do nothing. You can evaluate replacement, removal of bridge structures, and at the Bassfield Dam, again, do nothing or remove the dam. And, and Neil highlighted those, but I thought it might be a little helpful just to see them you know, very simplified like this. And then um, go back and look at the, um, at the groupings again. I mean, or if you wanna look at it like this, like, is there something that you think we might be missing? You know, for example, the conversation about the Bassfield Dam and any questions about those alternatives and options? Are there any other alternatives that you think that should be on this list that should be added to the um, to the packages. And then go back to those again. Oops, sorry about that. Let me let me just change this so you can see them all. Oh, that's too small. Okay. That'll have to do Maria, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I'll have to I'll have to zoom go down a little bit. Could I ask, what is the reconnect the river to the adjacent wetland? Oh, that's what's uh, yeah. I was gonna ask the same thing. Thanks, thanks, Norman. Sure. So, so this is immediately below the dam. There, um, there are extensive wetlands, primarily on the uh, east side that are- You know what they're talking about. On the Middleborough side. 
Right. So, so below the directly north of the pond and on the east side of the river, just below the dam, there is an extensive complex of wetlands that are slightly isolated from the river itself and from the from the pond by the the berm that's part of the part of the dam, and from the river by uh, a spoils berm. So when they actually did this dredging, they cast the the spoils to the side. And there's now a, a berm that runs along that edge that isolates the river channel, not isolates, but reduces the connection of the river channel to those adjacent wetlands. And that, that connectivity of a river to its surrounding wetlands and floodplain is one of the very key components of natural river hydrology that allows the system to work properly to prevent flooding and to allow the biology to work, all that kind of stuff. So, so that the thinking there is to what can be done to allow that connection to work better than it currently does. I, I guess I would be surprised that it's not connected. I, I know what you mean about the dredge spool, maybe at low flow, but I know being out there at the high levels um, actually took measurements with Dick Turner where the difference between the height of ass swamps and the height of the water in, in those wetlands was the same as it was right at the dam. At the time, it was a few inches. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe at high flow, it, it's connected. In other words, it, when it gets high, it all fills up. So I guess that's what I think user. that's correct. I mean, I, I've certainly seen many, many worse rivers who, who, are, who are disconnected to a much more severe degree than this is, but it's still not optimized. Yeah. I would just say um, we were, well, so again, our property borders the river pretty close to the dam. Um, and we have a little rock that we can walk out to and overlook the river. I mean, it is a grassland. You can essentially walk through the grasses um, and that would be all wetlands. And there's there's no water um, at all in that area. Um, so again, with the comment about the river being high right now, we have had quite a bit of rain, but the river is, is still um, extremely low. And I'm not a river expert, but it's really hard for me to understand how the Wareham Street Dam is more important than the Asquamsett Pond Dam because I see directly how when they poured up that dam, the water level in the river up where we are at least drops within a day. It's, it's sometimes impassable. So I don't think that has anything to do with any of these options that you're presenting, but I did want to just kind of throw that out there. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. And I, and I, I perhaps spoke a little, um, a little more than I should about, about that because, because they both are important. But I would say, and again, I don't want to be jumping to conclusions because we'll we'll get some of these answers from the from the modeling study. But just based on my observations and experiences with other rivers like this, I would say that the the impacts of the Asawamsit Pond Dam are more um, focused on that upper area, whereas the Wareham Street Dam is impacting the entire stretch of river from Wareham Street all the way back to Asawamsa Pond. The, 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 there's 13 feet of hydraulic drop that is no longer there as a result of that, of that dam. And that has changed the flow, the, the rate of flow, how sedimentation occurs, all of the processes are different be, because of that. So, so what you're talking about when you refer to removing Wareham Street Dam, I think to clarify for some of us, you're, you, it, there's kind of like two couple of drops there. There's the bascule dam and then there's another drop. But right, we both of them, yes. You're saying remove all of it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what, when, when we like, what, what Tom I think mentioned about lowering the, the bascule dam, it has been, you know, it's been done where it's been, that portion has been lowered but you're saying it's you would when you refer to removing it, it's not the same as lowering Mom, the basket. You're talking about removing it and lowering uh, kind of around the corner at that herring uh, herring run there right. to get 13 feet. You'd have to do more than remove the basket. Right, and my and more than that, my understanding from Chris Peck, and you know, I wasn't there, but this is my understanding was that when that drawdown occurred that, um, that Tom was talking about, 
the water level dropped by something like two to three feet. So that's, that's the amount of change that can be, was done operationally at the dam. So two to three feet is obviously not 13 feet, right? So the, the potential hydraulic change from actually removing the dam is much, much greater than what happened when that was opened up at that point in time. Right. I think that's what clarifies it for those of us who are kind of confused with, yeah. with, with removing versus just lowering it. That two to three feet was only up about 200 and something feet. That's it. The, the, the pool right. above the dam on the Wayham Street side, that pool lowered. That's it. The river didn't flow right down. See, Guys, we're about to run out of time just to let you know. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. The Go problem ahead. is it's it, it from the dam to the, to the Askill Dam. So be, be in our limited moments left here, does anyone, is there a particular bridge or something that we've missed or is there something here that people would like to have included that we haven't included in this mix of alternatives? Real quickly, um, it's been noted that, that, that the bridge, old Bridge Street Dam is historic. People like to look at it as an alternative. Could you open up the river by removing the earthen approach on the Middleborough side and leave the actual historic old uh, bridge in place, but allow for a high flow passage of water by removing the earth approach on the Middleborough side. Absolutely. I, I would second that, that is, as a really good suggestion because one of the things that I, I have mentioned in one of the previous meetings is that bridge is used by fishermen all the time. I've never been there without seeing a fisherman there. So it is, uh, it's, it's a, it's a resource. And the biggest constriction is at the railroad bridge. Um, one of the Heron ones, I believe Dave Cavanaugh went down there in 2016 and it was either 52 or 54 inches of water was able to pass through. That's the biggest constriction on the whole river. Great. Hi there, everyone. We're, I think we were combined in terms of the two breakout groups. Um, hopefully you all had a good discussion. Um, just to keep on schedule and to respect your all time, um, I just wanna kind of wrap up and then we can, I'm happy to stay on afterwards if we wanna continue any of the conversations. Um, let me just go into full screen mode. Um, so just, uh, um, it's been great to hear. I know in our group, we had a good um, good discussion and um, you know good kind of feedback in terms of some of the issues that um, the participants felt was important you know, to consider and some of the questions about the alternative packages. And I imagine you all had a good discussion as well. And we've been taking notes and recording in both sessions so that we can take what we heard from both breakout groups um, and then kind of bring it together in order to synthesize it and think about kind of the best steps moving forward. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, we are here today where we've been discussing our project objectives and discussing the alternatives. Um, next, we'll be running the H&H &H model on the alternatives, um, and this will be kind of starting shortly after this meeting here. Um, and then we'll be moving into the next phase, which is to try to estimate how the different alternatives meet the project objectives, right? And that's one of the main reasons why we wanted to get your feedback on both of these today, just to make sure that we're kind of going down the right path and that we're kind of looking at the right alternatives and using the right objectives in order to be able to um, evaluate these. Um, during our next public meeting, we are going to be actually spending time um, asking each of you to evaluate the and rank the different alternatives. And then the final stage in this process will be for us to report out um, and to share this information um, in, in order to kind of move forward with the next steps. Because I know that a lot of people, you know, us included, we want to see this planning process get implemented, right, and move into kind of changes in action on the ground. Um, so just a kind of overview of where we are in the process. I know that this is a lot of information, um, but essentially, you know, we are here in terms of this public workshop. Um, we're here where we're starting to model and evaluate the alternatives. And then moving forward, um, we have kind of two upcoming public workshops, but the main one will be to get your feedback on the um, alternatives. And then the final one will be more of a kind of final presentation of the results of, of this process, um, but also of the results of the model. And then the final one will be this kind of matrix where essentially this is, I know this is a lot of information, but what we're going to be doing is 
kind of taking all of the alternatives that we're looking at and then looking at our objectives and then saying, you know, how well does this alternative meet these objectives? And that's really just kind of a preview of where we're heading next. Um, so the final, the third and final public meeting for this, um, where we're specifically kind of asking for um, input um, is going to be hopefully, all fingers crossed, in person <laughs> in the fall. It's gonna be run more as a interactive workshop. Um, and during the workshop, we're, like I mentioned, we're going to be asking the participants to evaluate and rank the alternatives um, based on the process, project objectives. And then the results from the workshop and your input will become part of the final report and help inform the next steps in the process. So please, please plan to attend, tell your neighbors, tell your friends to, to attend because this is gonna be really the most important meeting in the process um, where we could actually begin to understand, right? How well do these different alternatives meet our objectives? Um, if there are any questions, um, both by the participants here in person or anybody who might be watching live um, through the LACEM or anybody who might be watching this after when it's posted online, please feel free to email us. Um, this is the email that we're using for this and also the watershed management planning process. Um, so feel free to take note of this. Um, you know, and another great thing would be for you to email this um, address and give us your contact information so that we could send you information on any upcoming events or any upcoming meetings. Because one of the challenges of not doing this in person is we don't have a sign up sheet. So it's hard because we don't necessarily have everybody's email addresses to send follow up emails, let you know when the next meetings are. So please um, make note of this email address, um, send us an email, even just a quick note saying, hey, please add me to the, you know, to the list. Um, and then I will, I promise we won't be sending a lot of emails, maybe just once a month, um, if that, just to let you know when we're having upcoming meetings um, and any, any other events that are you might want to be aware of. So um, so hopefully everybody's had a chance to write that down. Um, so I think, um, and this is just kind of an example of what that public process might look like. These are other events that I've um, helped host where we kind of can use this kind of interactive method in order to kind of get feedback and kind of get more input. Um, so hopefully we will all be in person and able to really kind of think through this process. Um, so just a big thanks to everybody who came and participated this evening. Um, really appreciate your kind of continued involvement. Great to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, and like I said, I'm happy to stay on if anybody has any other questions or wants to continue to talk about the objectives or didn't get a chance to finish anything they were thinking about during the process. Um, and also this is available, will be available um, on the, I think the Lake Cam um, website. So if anybody feels like, you know, there's a lot of information we presented today. And so if anybody wants to spend more time looking at the objectives, looking at the alternatives, please feel free to take your time to do that. And then to send any emails, happy to set up a call or do anything else in order to get all your feedback on this, um, on the project. Um, so with that, I think, Tom, I see you have a question before we sign I off. Just, I just want one quick clarification. When you said the Herring Commission puts on the Herring Festival, yep. you know, it's put on by the Tourism Committee in Middleborough. Um, we have nothing to do to organize it. And the reason why they put this on for, for years, people come and look at the herring and they go yep. to Plymouth to eat. So they wanted to keep people in, in Middleborough. So I just wanted just to clear that a lot of people think we run what we don't. <laughs> okay, thanks for that clarification, Tom. Excellent. Any um, other, feel free to jump in if there's anything else you would like to say. Yep, Janice. Um, just wondering, um, all the alternatives, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Will that be um, available anywhere so that I can look at each one of them individually and think about them? Or it, uh, it, will that be on Light Cam? Is that yep. what you mean? Kevin, um, Kevin, is that correct that um, you'll be posting this um, for people to watch after um, on Light Cam's website as well? Yes, we'll be posting this on our Vimeo and it will run on our TV channel. Lovely. Excellent. Thank you very much. And also, um, I know Janice, you're on the um, email list for the yes. um, APC Namaska yep. um, Gmail account. I could also send those two slides out to the participants, you know, who kind of anybody who's on that list so that you could get a chance just to look at those two slides. That would be helpful. Yeah, I'd like to see it too. Okay, great. Excellent. I will send those out so people can have more time. I know it was, it was a lot of information. It's today, a so lot of information. It is. Yes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yep. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, I think you're, you're muted. There we go. Um, this meeting to talk about in the fall time. Will this be what evening, day, weekend, weekday? Great question, Bill. Tell me what you all think is best. I'm, you know, the goal. Um, you know, well, that meeting. I, I, you know, it, yeah, working 
you know, Monday through Friday, the better to have an evening or a weekend type of weekend. Event. Okay. You know, I, I would love, I mean, if you all think it would be um, appropriate to maybe get a lot of people, I would even consider a weekend um, so that we could do it during the daytime. Um, you know, it'll probably be a longer um, and actually kind of more kind of workshop style. And so I think a weekend when people could put aside, you know, um, two hours um, would be great. Um, and we'll be doing a really big kind of media blast for that one just to get it out as wide as possible. And so if anybody has any suggestions, um, you know, I'm hoping to get that in the newspaper and everywhere else, just because that, like I said, is one of the kind of more important moments for us to get feedback is at that meeting. And so any suggestions or if anybody has any ideas for how to get the word out, um, you know, to the broader community, please feel free to send an email to that email address um, and suggest that or any days or times once we get closer to the um, scheduling it, we, we could also um, try to figure out what are the best days and times for people given the other events happening. Any other, any other questions? Thoughts? No? Great. Job. Great. Thank you all so much for joining this evening. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here and talk about the future of the Damascus River. And it's been great to see you all. And we'll hopefully see you all again in a couple of months um, to discuss the results of the H&H model.